podcast episode number two season two season two episode two so today last time we talked about uh why people go abroad and teach why you might want to go abroad and become an international educator from a professional standpoint and our goal in this episode is to focus on some of the personal benefits that we and others tend to get from going and living in a new country and working at an international school. So if you or someone that you know has ever pondered the question, why on earth would you do this? Hopefully this episode will give you some answers. If you're a teacher in the U.S. and you, I love teaching, but I hate (laughs) teaching in the U.S. because we're not loved and we don't get paid and everyone treats us like garbage. Well, then international education might just be your thing. Very well be. Yeah. Could very well be. So it has a lot of great things. It has some, you know, like everything, nothing's perfect. So with that, well, this time we'll start with some of the bad things uh, about teaching internationally. From a, They're not really about teaching internationally. They're more about... What happens to your life when you teach internationally? Yeah, and so in season one, you know, we talked a lot about this anyway, what it means to be an expat, some of the goods and the bad. And so this is really kind of, in many respects... A rehash of that but a little bit more specific to kind of the the intricacies of teaching internationally and how there are certain things that have to either be put on pause or that you may miss out on or might just have a different experience or have to leave behind because you are moving elsewhere at least from the bad things side and we won't go into too much detail about some of them because for example one of our Our topics today will be culture shock. We did a whole episode in season one about culture shock. Yes, so if you want to hear more about that specific topic, season one, episode two is your culture shock resource. Go check it out. Um, So anyways, so one of the hardest things, well, you know what? We started with culture shock. Let's start with culture shock, because of course. Any, moving anywhere, whether even within the US or within your own country, it can be scary. Uh, You're leaving behind friends, leaving behind family. Sometimes you might be moving across country Sometimes it might only be a couple of hours. But when you go to a whole other country, it's a different ballgame. You are in a new place, which means it's harder usually for your friends and family to visit. Uh, Depending on where you go, for the most part, at least in international education, odds are you don't speak the local language. Um, And there's a good chance that you won't know anybody. You might know one or two other people at the school you go work at, but it is by no means a guaranteed thing. So you're going to be thrown into a city, a country, and a school where everything is brand new. Yeah, not only that, but culture shock also involves the fact that even if you stay there for a really long time and become very immersed in the culture, you don't escape the label of the foreigner. In many languages, there are specific words for foreigner um, that are... Like, yeah, you are that person. Um, But also with culture shock and like being new in a place, there's also that um, realizing the differences in how things work, not just so much on the way that people are and what the culture is like, but also how everyday things work, which at times can be downright infuriating. So this is all stage two of culture shock. Again, if you go back to our (laughs) previous episode, stage one is the uh, honeymoon phase. Everything is new, it's exciting, it's amazing. Um, Shiny, I'm having fun, I'm doing new things, you know, furnishing my apartment and all of that fun stuff. Stage two is the I hate everything, uh, I hate it here, and I want to go home. Now you, you'll fluctuate back and forth, you'll always come back to stage two at points, and then eventually you'll get to, if you find that living in a new country is for you, eventually you'll get to stage three where things are just what they are. Yeah, you make uh, peace with a lot of things and for the most part, take things in stride. Yeah, it's kind of like living back home where, all right, I hate having to go to the DMV, but I have to do it. Whereas things will happen in a new country, I hate having to do this, but I have to do it. It's, it's, just, it's your new, it is what it is. It's your new norm, <laughs> okay? So, culture shock uh, for many expats is the thing that, well, culture shock combined with what we'll touch on next, is one of the main reasons that people come abroad and find that it's not for them. Exactly. And so on that note, part of stage two is missing friends and family. One of the really big downsides of living internationally, as we said, is leaving behind those people. Uh, Especially if you have children, 
You might be leaving behind cousins that they play with, their friends. As the children get older, leaving behind, you know, in their middle and high school, that can be especially difficult. They become enmeshed in their cliques and their friend groups and all of these things. And it's hard to start over. It is. And if you have, if you live close by to your family and they were present in the early stages of you raising your children, you're leaving behind your village. And that can be really scary because you have to build a new village and that takes time. Yeah. And, you know, it's not just for you, but again, for your children. Um, sometimes you may have to leave a beloved pet behind, depending on where you go. And that's, as we all know, when pets die, it's devastating. Yeah, so depending on where you go, you may or may not be able to bring your pet with you or it may take months or even years to bring them over. So leaving a pet can be difficult for you. It can be difficult for your children if they've had them since they were young. So leaving, leaving things behind is not just, not just family. Pets are part of the family. So uh, before we get into uh, more family as far as leaving behind in your home country, on the flip side of that, one of the downsides of being international is that, especially in education, but families come and go. So your child and you may make great friends with people only for them to leave after two or three years and having, find yourself having to start over. Or you might leave after two or three years having to start over. And for some, that takes a toll. Well, on everyone, it takes a toll, but uh, some handle it better than others. Yeah, for some, the cycle, that kind of perpetual cycle of goodbyes in international schools can be, can be taxing. Yeah, especially uh, if you work in a place where that idea is not common you know if you go to the u.s most schools don't have teachers cycling through every two to three years throughout the entire school um, so it's just something to be mindful of same with pets some countries have restrictions on bringing pets to them from another country so if you acquire a pet when you go abroad maybe you can take it with you sometimes you can sometimes you can't depending on where you go and with leaving family and, and friends behind also come what can sometimes be difficult about managing responsibilities that you're leaving behind at home if you have a mortgage, making sure that that's taken care of. Um, if you have major repairs that have to be done in your home, figuring things out like a contractor, if there's no one close by to help you out can be difficult. And of course, if you have um, parents or grandparents that require care, that can also be very tricky, not only because caring for aging family members is difficult as it is, but because you're not there and that's an added layer of difficulty. Yeah, and a lot of schools don't necessarily give time off to go home and just be with family if they need extra care. It's usually just bereavement leave is, is pretty common, um, at least as far as what we know. Again, we are not the be all end all of international educational knowledge, but you know, leaving your parents behind, especially as they are older and maybe can't care for themselves, maybe you have to hire a caretaker or maybe they have to hire one or you have to rely on a, a sibling or a cousin. It's heartbreaking at times. Yeah, and that's something that even could even add an extra layer of tension in your family relationships if you um, if you have siblings, for example, that may be taking the brunt of the care for an aging parent or an aging family member, balancing that with, well, you're not here. Yeah, so it, it brings a feeling of guilt, um, which is not easily overcome. And we both speak from experience in this regard. It's not easily overcome. So it's definitely something to keep in mind uh, as you think about moving abroad. How will I help keep, how will I help take care of my family back home? Yeah, and with that comes um, something that sometimes people not don't necessarily think about, but it's something to keep in mind. It's, I would say, an unlikely event. It's probably rare, but yes, in many cases, you are teaching internationally with a higher compensation package, but you always run the risk of currency fluctuations that may devalue your compensation. And so if you have to take care of responsibilities at home and you're teaching in a place that goes through a severe currency downturn, that can affect how much you can take care of at home, how your responsibilities at home are affected. So it's something to keep in mind if you're going to a place where you're paid in local currency and the local currency is not stable. Yeah. So those are all things to keep in mind. You know, as Anna said too, thinking about a lot of expats have homes in other countries or in their home countries. Uh, who's managing that, especially if you're not renting it out? If you are renting it, is it long-term, short-term? If you have an emergency, what's gonna happen? Who fixes it when the water heater breaks? 
or if you live in Canada and the pipes freeze and burst come spring. So who's handling those kinds of things? Because again, you can't just pop on over to take care of those. So they're all considerations that you have to think about when you look at not just international teaching. Again, we've talked about a lot of these things before, but when you think about moving to a new country. Absolutely. Um, so those are really some of the major detractors that people find uh, when they move abroad. Again, leaving behind friends and family and this idea of culture shock and not feeling like you fit in really is what we've seen that drives people most likely to go back to their home country. Yeah. Uh, at least from a personal, personal perspective. Sometimes people miss the uh, professional parts of back home, but it's really a personal choice. Yeah, it is. And it's probably what... What people comment on the most and one of the reasons that you hear the most about people leaving the international life is, well, we want to be close to family, we want to be close to cousins or friends or just return to the community that we left behind. Yeah. So as you go abroad, be thinking about who you're leaving behind. How will you care for them? How will you care for things? Will you sell everything and put what's left in a storage? Uh, or will you try to manage things from abroad? How will you handle currencies? Sometimes, again, as Anna said, currencies can fluctuate greatly. We saw the dollar for the first time this year be overvalued, more, be more valuable than the euro in, I think, since the euro's conception. Yeah. So things can change. And what, you know, especially now with, as you look at what's happening with the world economy in 2022, uh, how will that manage, how will that affect your choices going forward when you're not getting paid in a currency you fully understand? All right, so that sort of takes us through some of the cons of international teaching. Um, and as we said, now we'll get on to some of the major benefits of being an international teacher. And I think we'll lead off with one thing that we talked about last time, which was cultural diversity in the workplace. But it's also obviously because you're in a new country, you're going to experience all sorts of fun, cultural diverse activities uh, when you're not at work. So one of the, for me, one of the best things about living abroad is all the food you get to eat. Uh, in China, street noodle, street rice, uh, John Bing, which is the best food perhaps ever made. <laughs> if you're not sure, just look it up. J-I-A-N-B-I-N-G. It's the best thing ever. Uh, I've learned to kind of make it at home. but It is delicious. I agree. Korea had great food uh, from gimbap, bibimbap, uh, takgalbi, um, here in the Middle East. All the shawarma and falafel you can eat, it's amazing. Yeah, the variety of grilled meat and vegetables that comes with it. Spices. Spices, different types of, I don't know how many ways there are of cooking rice, but there are a lot in every single part of the world that we've been to. So food and, and variety of foods and, and, and a more extensive palate than Maybe what you have in your home country is definitely a, a highlight of it. And of course, food itself is a highly cultural experience and carries a lot of tradition with it. So if you get the opportunity to try it with a local family or from a local business or participate in a traditional meal, highly recommend it. Yeah. So, you know, you also get the chance to learn a new language. Usually sometimes they're harder than other, whether that's Arabic, Chinese, or you know, maybe Russian. But you have the opportunity to learn a new language, which, let's be honest, everyone should speak two languages at least somewhat. Agreed. If, you know, if, in my personal opinion. It's um, also actually pretty healthy for your brain. Studies have found evidence that people that speak more than one language have more plastic brains or brains that can extend more for learning. So good for your brain. Yeah, you'll also get a chance to experience, you know, the U.S. is full of history, but um, as a country, not that old. There's plenty of indigenous history, which is very fascinating and worth, uh, you know, seeing and being a, being a part of as much as you can. But nothing back home is going to be like being in Istanbul, where you'll have the Hagia Sophia, which is nearly 2,000 years old, or uh, the Colosseum in Rome, or the Great Wall in China, or Angkor in Cambodia. You get these cultural experiences that are so much closer and so much more interesting to personally to me. I, maybe not to you, and that's fine. But that you don't get to experience when you live in Milwaukee. Nothing against Milwaukee. If you're from <laughs> Milwaukee, I'm sorry. I don't. I, I mean, I've never been to Milwaukee. It looks nice. I saw <laughs> bridesmaids. It looked cool. But I mean, you know, 
Milwaukee. Milwaukee. You didn't have to walk. Cleveland. No one, no one says anything good about Cleveland. <laughs> Sorry if you're from Cleveland. Um, that episode of 30 Rock said a lot of good things about Cleveland. So okay. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Apparently there's an Ikea. Um, <laughs> okay. I feel bad for the sports teams, though. The Browns. Oh, man. The, uh, the... Guardians now? Is that what they are? Well, yeah, it used to be the, the Indians. Guardians. It's now the Guardians. And the uh, basketball team. The Cavs. Cavaliers, yeah. But we digress. You guys have Ohio State. That's about it. Sorry, anyways. Nothing bad about Ohio or Cleveland <laughs> in particular. But you have more cultural opportunities when you live in a, a new place. Maybe that's, like we said, maybe that's sites, maybe it's language, maybe it's food, maybe it's getting to experience local customs, maybe you get invited to a wedding. Um, I've been to wedding celebrations in at least two countries. Yeah. Uh, well, three if you count the U.S., I suppose, which can be, is, is great. But in Russia, in the U.S., in the Dominican Republic, I think that's it. I think so. I think so. And each one is different and has its own you know, take on things. And it, so it's just really interesting to get to experience these new things that you wouldn't necessarily get to experience back home. Absolutely. And not only in the place where you're living, but also in the places that you get to travel, either in your own time or in student trips, if you get to do those, depending on the level of teaching that you do. Yeah. So cultural diversity, and you know, that's from a cultural point, but also you get to meet people. You'll get to meet colleagues that are from your local place. Um, you'll get to meet people out and about which is great. And you're going to meet people that you work with from other countries. So you get just a really great perspective on the world. Um, I find personally that it opens up how you view everything um, to a way that if you've never really been abroad or lived abroad, or if you're one experience, it's like, oh, I'm going to Cancun, or I'm going to London. Great, you should. But when you move abroad and move to a new place, it's, it's a bit different because you're actually enmeshed and pushed into these new situations, these new cultures in a different way. Yeah, and it also lets you see that, you know, places that, that you may not grow up being super aware of, people are people like everywhere else and have issues like people have everywhere else. And it, it gives you a, a new perspective and an expanded perspective on the commonality of just being people. And so I think that in that regard, it, it helps you become more empathetic towards people in general, just because they're people. Yeah, empathetic and, as we said, open-minded. You know, you realize that, hey, I'm from this country and maybe things about my country aren't the best. It doesn't mean you can't still be patriotic and love where you're from, but it doesn't mean that the way things are done there are always the right way. Yeah, it definitely shows you that, well, you know, other people do things differently and you may or may not agree with it or think that is the best way, but it may work for them. And getting to see that can also be really eye-opening and to an extent kind of grounding. Or you'll see things like, hey, they do it differently this way. Why don't we do it that way back home? Also that. Because um, it makes far more sense to do it this way than do something the way we do it in, the, in your home country. So. Yeah. Um, so we'll get into, before we get into the travel opportunities, we'll get into the nitty gritty of the nice things about being an international teacher from the personal perspective. And uh, one of the first things is, well, we'll talk about the less exciting ones, um, flights. So most schools will offer you a flight to and from your country of origin every year, a round trip ticket every year, whether that's, you know, back to and from the U.S., from the U.K., Australia, whatever. And so it's nice, at the very least, you know you're going to get, have the opportunity to go back and see friends and family uh, without having to pay for it. Yeah, so one of the things that is taken into consideration when you are um, hired at an international school is what's called your home of record. And some of these additional benefits like flights are calculated based on your home of record or what you may be offered for a shipping stipend is based on your home of record, for example. So in that regard, that's kind of an extra layer of support that you get um, as part of your relocation. But it is a way to kind of guarantee that you will get home at some point with some support if your financial situation is a little tighter for whatever reason you can for the most part always count on one annual leave that will take you home at least once a year yeah 
So for the next three, they all kind of roll in together. So for example, we're going to talk about uh, your discretionary income, your take home pay. Um, it might go up depending on where you are, but that's dependent on two other things being your taxes and your housing. As we all know, housing in the US is incredibly expensive, especially in the cities. You look at San Francisco, New York, Chicago, LA, you might be paying $3,000 a month for a studio apartment. Now, if you live out in a rural area, sure, you can afford a lot more um, and still get, for the most part, get the same pay as you would at a public school in the city. So if you're there, that's different. But um, one of the biggest things is housing. Most schools, not all, not all, Western Europe being an exception um, that they don't offer housing. Some schools, for example, in Hong Kong might not offer housing. It just depends. But most schools offer either housing that they own or they give you a stipend to cover your own housing. And that alone can save you an untold amount of money every year if you're coming from your home country. Yeah, so since for the vast majority of people, housing represents a significant expense on their take home pay, the fact that you don't have to factor that into your monthly expenses in many cases, either because you get a stipend that covers all or most of your rent or because you are placed in school leased housing or in campus housing or whatever other arrangement your school may have does mean that by default your discretionary income should be higher it depends it depends on where you're Definitely. coming from um you know it just, it, that really depends but if you're in the u.s and you're paying fifteen hundred dollars a month for rent or say well, we'll we'll use rent because mortgage you can't just be like oh I'm not going to pay that anymore. Um, all of a sudden, that's sixteen thousand dollars a year that you are no longer paying, uh, and so that's sixteen thousand dollars you can use for travel, for retirement, for paying off debts, student loans, however you choose to do it. Yeah, so um, it's discretionary income. Yeah, and so that alone is one of the biggest benefits of working international, uh, both as a teacher and elsewhere as not a teacher but for us as educators we don't have to worry about housing we you know we like not having to deal with that yeah it is Um, it is definitely an added benefit and with that um it also means that in some cases um there will be some maintenance services provided um so even if you don't know the local language there may be some Um, additional support that way um, on things that can um, be arranged if you need to check your bathroom because there's a leak or your ventilation is not working properly or an appliance breaks. Yeah, but don't go into a school expecting that. No. Um, That's usually only if it's school-sponsored housing. If you find your own place, you are pretty much responsible for what happens. Exactly. And you will have to deal with the landlord just like you would back home. Um, So be mindful of that. Um, you know, if you have a mortgage, usually people will either sell their home or rent it out, in which case they're still not paying the mortgage. Someone else is um, and getting a place to live at the same time. So it really works out this, uh, this idea of not paying for housing <laughs> quite nicely for all teachers. Yeah. So one of the one of the biggest selling points for a lot of international schools, and it's something that you may see advertised on school profiles. Um, within recruitment agencies is the savings potential. And of course, that calculation varies from country to country, um, depending on family size, on the benefits that you get. But in many cases, you will be able to see your savings potential on a specific location, a specific school, because the school includes that estimate in their profile information on recruitment agency websites, for example. And so it's not so much in some cases a question of how much you can earn but more a question of how much you can save and both go hand in hand but um, the bigger selling point on one location over the other for example could be the savings potential and of course the cost of living on a certain place um, will affect that in some places you can save more because the cost of living is low in other places you can save more because your salary is going to be high so do take a note that if you look on, uh, you know, like Search Associates, ISS, whatnot, those companies are not the ones who are responsible for maintaining that information. It is up to the school. So in certain cases, you will find 
that the salary or the savings potential may not have been updated for several years. Yeah, so, so of course, um, in especially in the current environment that we're in and with how much things have changed in the past three years, it's always a good idea to confirm those numbers if they haven't been updated recently. Yeah, but as Anna said, you know, you do tend to end up with more money. So you may take a pay cut from the US, for example, to move to say Latin America. But the cost of living on average might be far less where you might uh, pay so much for gas back home, you'll pay less, for example. That's just, you may not, it just depends. But in general, the cost of living ends up being less. So while you may not get less in salary, the cost of living negates that fact where you can still end up taking home more each month because you're not paying for housing, you're not paying for uh, as much in groceries or all of these different little things. Which sort of leads to the next part, and you're also not paying taxes. In some cases. In some cases. So if you work for uh, the any school that works explicitly with a U.S. embassy, um, a U.S. embassy school, such as the... Uh, I believe the Anglo-American School of Moscow, for example, um, you are considered a federal employee and you will have federal taxes taken out, which is fine. Um, you're still, you can still, I think for the most part, even with those, I think you can still apply for, um, so most expats will apply for what's in the US, a foreign earned income exclusion, which means that since your money is earned and you're generally taxed on it in country, you're not paying taxes back home because it's double taxation. Yeah. And that alone can also save you several thousand dollars a year, which then also helps you increase your discretionary income. Yeah, and so also in the other thing that helps with understanding what your take-home pay and what will become your discretionary income is, is that the vast majority of international schools advertise after-tax salaries. Even if you are paying any portion of local taxes, the tax that you will see in an offer or in a school profile is going to be the after-tax salary. Yeah. Now, you know, we recommend don't take our word for how to do all this stuff. We again recommend, as we did in season one, seeing a professional when it comes to uh, taxes and accounting and all of those kinds of things, retirement. Um, but, you know, it is a, a big boom for many expats, especially teachers. Uh, I guess, which I guess also leads us back to one more con I want to mention. Yeah. Which is unlike the US, where most schools are public schools for sure, or a private school where you might have a 403B. Public schools, you get put into Social Security and then a retirement plan. In international education, you are responsible for your own retirement. Yes, and that in some aspects can be great because maybe you have a little bit more say on where your investments go and can make different decisions than what an employer, um, an employer sponsor plan is. But on the other hand, it does mean that if nothing gets done, it's on you. And however many years you're not contributing to your retirement are years lost. Yeah. So, you know, it's fine. It, most, most of us make it work just fine. We've done our research, we figure it out. But, you know, as if you want to be an international teacher and you do want to say, take that foreign earned income exclusion, if you qualify, it means you also can't have a 401k or an IRA back home because those are, those don't work with tax exempt salaries. Exactly. So very important that you look at the different options that you have. If you have retirement funds that you're leaving behind in the U.S., what are going to be your options after you're no longer a U.S. employee? And so, of course, the best way to do that is to consult with a financial advisor and a tax professional that has experience with expatriate professionals. Yeah, especially if you've been in the, the U.S. for a while or, you know, and you already have a sizable retirement account built up. How are you going to mitigate the fact that you can no, maybe no longer maybe no longer contribute to that and keep building up that specific account, which means you might technically have to let that one just grow on its own and start from scratch, which is can be daunting. But yeah, and so depending on on the tax regimes that you find yourself, um, you may definitely need to have your taxes taken care by a professional if you are in a mix of tax regimes. If you had part of your year with income in the U.S. Don't try to do this by yourself. It's, yeah. it's not worth it. As with all things, we recommend talking to a professional. 
uh, to see if you qualify for a foreign earned income exclusion. Not everybody does. Uh, it depends on a number of different factors, um, as well as what country you're living in, all of those kinds of things. So, uh, but if you do qualify, it is, it's very helpful. Yeah, and so rounding things up, yes, international education is not the gold mine that it was 30, 35 years ago, but the opportunities are definitely there. Um, and there's uh, support in your living that kind of helps you worry a little bit less about, let's say, everyday things because some things are taken care of for you. Um, professional communities are very nurturing. And of course, um, you have more possibilities to travel, explore the world, get to know different cultures. If that's important to you, then international education could be a potential career path for you, for sure. And we highly recommend it. So that brings us to the last point, which is travel opportunities, which uh, I yeah. So, you know, most people do enter this profession internationally because they want to travel. That being said, it doesn't, again, look fantastic on the resume when you're jumping school to school every two years. Like schools anywhere, schools want longevity in their staff as much as possible. But being international schools, they do tend to understand that people may not be there for 10 to 15 to 20, 25, 30 years like you would back home in your home country. But when you come abroad, you do have the opportunity to travel far more than you do in the U.S. Uh, you're just much closer to things. Not, not always. You might be in, I mean, if you're in South Africa, you're closer to parts of Africa, but everywhere else is still quite far. It is. Um, but that's still exciting because you're close to countries that you've never been close to before. If you're in... Um, if you're in Argentina, you have all of Amer South America at your fingertips. If you're in the Middle East, like us, we are close to Europe, we're close to Africa, we're close to uh, South Asia. Everywhere is quite close. If you're anywhere in Asia, everything's quite close. So you have these opportunities, plus combined with the breaks we mentioned, to really get out there and see the world. Yeah, which... For some people, it's something that maybe they dream of doing when they retire, and by the time you retire, that can be complicated by a number of factors. So it's a way to kind of address those dreams of traveling while you are still working, while you are still an active professional, um, in some cases, while you are still young and healthy for the most part, not that older people can't travel or can engage in international teaching, definitely can. Um, but it's a way to address those travel dreams without having to wait until you retire, where you may or may not have the possibility for a number of reasons. Yeah, you may be not healthy, maybe you just don't have the funds. And so this is a great way to get out there and yeah, just experience everything. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say something else now to you guys, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> That's probably a good a good signal that maybe this is a good place to stop until episode three. Again, this entire season is going to be focused on international education, and we're going to be talking about the recruitment process, what it looks like to go into international education, either as a new teacher, as an experienced teacher, as someone who's transitioning to teaching. All of those things we're going to talk about in more detail. So make sure that you are following us on Spotify if you want to make sure that you don't miss an episode episode or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you prefer to see us and yeah. watch on on video. So I'll just give you a preview of what our next episode maybe two um, will be about is we'll be looking at getting started in international education. So what kind of certifications do you need? Uh, what experience? Prepping your resume. Um, and we'll briefly introduce job placement companies, but that'll be a whole episode unto itself so that you are able to understand what that goes through and what that's like. One of the reasons why we want to spend some time explaining how to get started is because it seems to be a fairly common question, at least based on what I hear from Cameron that follows the international education um, community a little bit closer on social media. A recurring question is, how do we start? We will address that in episode three. Yeah, we'll look at different kinds of certification, whether in person, online, masters, non-masters, um, different programs like Moreland or if you're coming from the UK your PGC or your PGCEI or some of those other terms your QES that um, we'll, we'll cover some of those things a bit more in detail and you know just uh, 
give you our opinions based on how they're viewed by schools, which for the most part is fine. Um, and that's what, we're, that's what we'll be going over. What we won't talk about at all this season, if you're interested in it, is teaching uh, English as a foreign language. Yeah, so, so we are strictly going into international schools, so not going to teach English at an academy or anything like that, but you're teaching school, a grade level, a subject matter. That's what we're going to be focusing on this season. Yeah, international educators clearly de delineate the difference between teaching at an international school and teaching English as a language. Not that there's anything wrong with that, um, but we can, I, I guess we'll go into it a little bit, uh, maybe at the end of this season, just to give you uh, what some of the differences are and why people tend to not do that if they want to be an actual educator. It is a way in a which... a full-time, lifelong profession. It is a way in which many people do transition into teaching later on, but we're going to presume um, that you are already an education professional or are studying education and are looking at international teaching as a possible career path. Yeah. So next, until next time for episode three, getting started with your international teaching um, route program, whatever you want to call it. So. Join us.